Hi everyone and welcome to CTL's Education Professional Development Series. My name is Amy Alcalisi, EdTech Project Manager here at CTL and I'm joined by Stephanie Shea, Marketing Manager. If you are not familiar with CTL, we've been headquartered in Portland, Oregon, providing innovative IT solutions to education and government customers for over 26 years. We're a Google for Education partner specializing in rugged CTL Chromebooks, laptops, convertibles, tune ones and tablets designed specifically for K-12 education. Over the last two and a half years, we've worked with Google to introduce a line of CTL Chromebooks that have been recommended by PC Magazine as the best choice for Chromebooks in education. As part of our commitment to education, CTL offers free professional development webinars on a variety of topics relevant to K-12 EdTech. Today's webinar is Desmos Graphing Calculator Beyond the Basics, presented by Michael Fenton of Desmos. He is the lead instructional designer. Before we get started, I'd like to review the attendee interface so you know how to participate in today's webinar. You should see something that looks like this on your own computer desktop in the upper right hand corner. You are listening in using your computer speaker system by default. If you would prefer to join over the phone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. You may type any questions into the question pane of the control panel during the presentation and they will be addressed in a question and answer session at the end of today's presentation. But before we begin, I'd like to take a poll to learn more about our attendees today. Please indicate if you've ever used Desmos Graphing Calculator. We'll take a moment to give you a chance to fill out the poll. This is Stephanie. Hi, should I go ahead and launch the poll, Amy? Yeah. Gonna... Okay, I will do that. Thank you. Let me know, everyone, can you see the poll? Yes. Excellent. Looks like most people. All right. Do you have any responses there? Yes. I'm going to go ahead and close it and I'll show the results. Half and half. Um, no experience and half have some. So that's pretty much the perfect mix, I think, for this webinar. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Okay. And just so everybody knows, this is part two, although um, Michael will go into some prior information as well. But before I turn it over to Michael for the presentation, I just want to remind everyone about some of the resources for us educators uh, from the, the Nevada 21 program. When you visit the nr21.ctl.net website, you can learn more about the upcoming professional learning opportunities, sign up for the events. Um, you can watch webinars that have been prior recorded as well and join the Google Plus private community. So now, Stephanie, she's doing mm -hmm. the transfer, I would now like to introduce Michael Fenton of Desmos Graphing Calculator. Michael has experience as a classroom teacher, graduate school instructor, curriculum writer, and professional development consultant. He loves exploring how to use technology in ways that foster curiosity and creativity in the math classroom. Michael will now show you some features of Desmos calculator that goes beyond the basics. Welcome, Michael. Yeah, thank you, Amy, and thank you, Stephanie. Uh, good morning, everybody who's following along uh, live and also those folks who are watching this after the fact as a recording. Uh, today is uh, a chance to dive a little bit deeper into some of what we unpacked during the first webinar session, but I will backtrack just a tiny bit to make sure we're all on the same page and, and ready to move forward. So a little bit of history of Desmos. It started as a free online graphing calculator, and as a classroom teacher, I actually used Desmos in my classroom uh, just about every day to explore problems, um, find solutions to things we were working on in class, and then more recently uh, using activities that folks have built with uh, something called the Desmos Activity Builder. So the first session was all about the graphing calculator, and the second session is all about the activities that folks in the community and folks here on the Desmos team have built, uh, ready to use in your classroom, whether you're fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh, eighth, or all the way up through twelfth grade. And so we'll we'll take a look at those activities that exist, 
And before we look at specific activities, I actually want to lay some groundwork here for, for the entire session. So we'll be looking at two main things this morning or evening, if you're watching this later on. Uh, and those two things are activities that we've built and tools that we've built to support those activities. And in a nod to the Common Core State Standards where there are two kinds of standards, there are the content standards and the practice standards, I've often heard those two categories of standards described as the nouns and the verbs. The nouns are the what you're going to study. So that might be you know, factoring quadratics or it might be um, exploring rational expressions or, or something like that. It's the what, the specific math content. Whereas the practice standards, those are the verbs. It's the manner in which students and teachers will explore ideas in the classroom. They're kind of the action verbs that, that surround those nouns. Well, in the same way, Desmos has built activities, and those are the nouns. It's the what uh, you might use in the classroom. And then we've also built a set of tools to help teachers use those activities and facilitate discussions around those. So those kind of the action words uh, surrounding those activities. So that framework will lead us through our time together during this webinar, the nouns and the verbs, the activities and the tools. And so we'll start actually with activities. And I don't know if anyone's, uh, anybody watching this has ever been to the Desmos blog. It's simple, simply just uh, blog.desmos.com. But you'll find a number of posts from the team and a post from a couple of weeks ago describes some of the principles we use when we're building our activities. Folks have asked us, you know, what is the pedagogy that drives your activity design? And I want to start by nodding to this and actually looking a little more closely at these principles because the four activities that we'll look at later on in the webinar um, are my attempt to illustrate some of the principles that we use in designing activities. And I'm going to take this approach because, number one, I think it's helpful to understand how those specific activities function in the classroom and what our goals are there. But also by highlighting these principles that we use as we design activities, I think teachers can have some takeaways that extend beyond Desmos activities and actually even beyond digital activities to things that you might do related to a textbook or paper and pencil or or something else in the classroom that may or may not have to do with technology at all. So hopefully you have a number of takeaways from the session today, both digital and non-digital. So speaking of that activity building code, these principles that we as a team have assembled, uh, just picking things out from our conversations and, and putting them on paper, um, there's 13. And I'm going to move through them fairly quickly here and then drill down deeper on four of them. So. The first one is when we're building activities, we try to incorporate a variety of verbs and nouns. If an individual activity that a student is working through, if every single action is solve, 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 that gets kind of boring and stale, and it also doesn't push student thinking in very flexible and diverse ways. So we try to uh, vary the verbs that are involved. So it might be solve, it might be explain, it might be settle a dispute, it might be illustrate an example. If we vary those verbs, we end up with, in our opinion, as a, uh, as a team, we end up with more interesting, engaging, and profitable activities. Uh, the second principle from that building code is that we often ask for informal analysis before formal analysis. So we might ask students to sketch something before we ask them to write a function for a graph. We might ask them to come up with a brief informal argument before we ask them to come up with a formal proof. So begin informally and then move towards formal analysis. Number three, we try to create intellectual need for new mathematical skills. More on that in a couple of moments. We try to create problematic activities where there actually is a problem that feels like it needs solving rather than students asking, why do I have to do this? And the teacher saying, well, because I said so. We feel like we can come up with more problematic activities that beg to be solved. Number five, we like to give students opportunities to be both right and wrong in different and interesting ways. And there's, there's a lot going on here. To be right in different and interesting ways, that demands interesting questions, um, questions that invite a variety of responses. And likewise, when students answer something incorrectly, we want it to be 
um, the launching point into a discussion about rich mathematics and not just a, an opportunity for students to feel pride or shame uh, about whether they got it right or wrong and then move on. We actually want these responses to generate interesting discussions. Number six, we like to delay feedback for reflection. We like to connect representations wherever possible. And moving on to the second half, we like to create objects that promote mathematical conversations between teachers and students. We feel like a, a silent classroom is a, a wasted opportunity. There's a lot of human potential in the room for interaction, and we try to foster that interaction rather than um, invite silence into the math classroom. Number nine, we like to create cognitive conflict, some tension between maybe different student responses. You know, one student says, I think it's going to do this, and another student says, I think it's going to be this way. And then we want to settle that conflict and, and come to some sort of resolution as a group. Number 10, we like to keep exposition, like the explanatory parts of our activities, short and focused. Students often don't read the two or three or four paragraphs that accompany their textbook lessons, so we want our exposition to be short, but also focused on things that they've done and said in that lesson. Number 11, we like to integrate strategy and practice. Uh, and then number 12, create activities that are easy to start and difficult to finish. I don't know if you've ever heard the phrase, low floor, high ceiling, but this is definitely a nod to that. And then number 13, we ask proxy questions. So would we use this activity in our own classrooms? It's got to pass a certain uh, threshold for quality before we're uh, happy to share this with the world on uh, our website, teacher.desmos.com. So uh, thanks for suffering through uh, me reading some slides. I know in presentations that's not, not the best move. But I wanted to lay that foundation so that when we actually look at specific activities, we've got uh, a framework of our building code in mind. So now I'll turn our attention to our website, teacher.desmos.com. This is a repository of hundreds of ready-to-use activities using Desmos technology, uh, ranging from 5th through 12th grade, and really with a sweet spot in maybe 7th through 10th grade. And we'll look at four of those principles, four elements of our building code in practice, in a sense. This is how those principles have played out in specific activities. And you're welcome to, uh, if you're following this live, you're welcome to play alongside or just watch as I navigate through a few of these activities. If you're watching this as a recorded broadcast, uh, here's my strong, strong invitation to you. Pause each time we hit a new activity play along uh, on your own, and then unpause to see how uh, we navigated through it in the live session. So here's the first principle that we're going to unpack with a little more detail. It's the fifth one from that list, and it's the idea of giving students opportunities to be right and wrong in different and interesting ways. And the activity that I want to use to illustrate that principle is called sketchy fractions. So I'll go ahead and launch that activity. And Amy and Stephanie, would you just holler at me? I want to make sure that the screen share didn't break when I switched from Keynote to Chrome. Are we still uh, looking at my screen? Yes, uh, I see it, yes. <laughs> OK, wonderful. Well, then what I'm going to do is create a new class code and invite anyone who's following along live to go to student.desmos.com and type in this five character code. You can go uppercase, lowercase, or whatever combination you want. It's not case sensitive. But if you go to student.desmos.com and type in 5FNZE, you'll land in this activity. I'll leave this up for a few more seconds, and then I'll actually go type that code in. And since I know some of the folks are going to be following this as a recording, I'm going to walk through a couple screens and discuss what we mean by giving students interesting opportunities to be right and wrong. So a few more seconds on this screen. If you are following along and you want to jot that code down on a notepad near your device, that's, that's a great idea. 5FNZE. Go ahead and copy that. And go to student.desmos.com. And I'll go ahead and type that code in and click join. So when students log in, this is what they see. And this is our first activity of the four, so I'll add a little more detail here. Um, 
all of these activities, as students work through them, we describe them as networked tasks. So students are working on individual devices, whether they're Chromebooks, as may be the case for many folks in Nevada 21, or laptops or tablets, whatever the case may be. But all of these individual student screens are linked together through a teacher dashboard, uh, and I'll showcase some of the features in the dashboard later on. So here's how I would respond to this particular task. I've got a square here, and I'm going to use the sketch tools to shade half of this square and be as accurate as I can. So I could sketch like this. Maybe I want a more precise line, so I'll use the line tool for sketch. And I'll do my best to shade half of it. It won't be a perfect shading, but that gives the idea. And then I'm going to go on to the next screen as a student. But, oh, let's see. Here's that square again. Use the sketch tool to shade half of it in another way. So this actually begs the question that as a teacher, I'm driving at on the first screen. I want to see all the different ways that students have sketched one half and then use those responses to spark discussions in the room. I think that there are interesting ways to be right that are not all the same. So here's my first attempt, and here's another attempt. And I'm even inspired by the wording of the question, not that it's that profound or anything, but I'm inspired to stretch my thinking a little bit, maybe get, get outside of my comfort zone, and instead of sketching half in a way that I think another classmate might sketch it, I'm going to sketch half in a way that I think might be unique. And then these responses, they're all zapped immediately. And we'll see, we've got a few students over here. All of these responses are sent to what's called my teacher dashboard. So this tab right here is the student view. And this tab right here is the teacher view. And so we just have a few folks following along live in the broadcast. And I noticed that all three of the responders use the same approach on screen one. But if I jump ahead to screen two, and I was a little bit faster than some of the other folks following along, I've shaded this in a different way. And in fact, I can envision several other ways that students might shade half of it. Maybe it's the top half. Maybe it's the left half. Maybe it's the first visual we had here, but shading the top right half instead of the bottom left half. Or, if I clear this, maybe we would have a student who, you know, sort of haphazardly splits this into two sections and shades half of it. Well, not quite half of it, one out of the two sections, but then we have a discussion as a class, is this half? How do you know if it is or if it isn't? So the whole design for this activity, Sketchy Fractions, is to gather student thinking and then use that to launch into rich classroom discussions. In this case, we've got a square shaded one half in two different ways and hopefully looking at the entire class more than two different ways. And then moving on, we've got a triangle, three equal sides, shade half of that, and then shade half of the triangle in another way. We then move on to the square with one quarter, and one quarter of the triangle, and then a recap, looking at the key ideas there, uh, leading a discussion to wrap things up, and then a couple of challenges. Shade the square however you want, and then state what fraction you've shaded. So here's an example of students having a bit of freedom. And so there are a lot of different ways to answer this, uh, this problem, this task, and a lot of different correct ways to respond to this, which could lead to interesting discussions. So here I'd say 1 sixth or 1 out of 6. All right, let's jump back to the slides. And that's our, our attempt at just one illustration of this principle, the idea that we love to give students opportunities to be right and wrong in different and interesting ways. And I'll give a quick nod to another one of the principles. We mentioned that we like to gather informal student thinking. And we think that the sketch tool is actually a great way to gather informal student thinking. Um, there'd be an opportunity where a grid would be totally helpful on a sketch screen. But we left those particular sketch screens rather open-ended and, and with not a whole lot of math uh, layered on in terms of a grid or some other markers. We wanted students to have uh, the freedom to divide that square or triangle up in whatever way they saw fit. So that's one activity. Let's take a look at a second activity. And the goal for this activity is to showcase something where 
we've created an activity that we think is easy to start but rather difficult to finish. Again, it's the low floor, high ceiling approach. And I think back to my, my days in the classroom just year before last, my favorite tasks were the ones where everybody could begin. There was this wide open invitation, everybody can get started and do something meaningful. But then even my strongest students would have something engaging to work on through the entire task. It wasn't easy for everybody, but then over too soon for some students. It had something to offer for everyone for the duration of the activity. And we recently released something called Point Collector. Now, uh, let me jump back. Sketchy Fractions has a variety of grade levels where this would be appropriate. Um, younger grades for the first time that they've seen some of these concepts. Uh, but as many of us know, sometimes our students in older grades need a refresher and an engaging, rich conversation might be the way to refresh some of those ideas. So I would probably use this task even up into middle school in some situations. Point Collector is something that we think of as geared at uh, sixth grade and beyond. And when I say beyond, I've actually used this in upper middle school and I've used this in a high school classroom with success. And that, I think, illustrates some of what we're talking about here with activities that are easy to start and difficult to finish, not just with individual students in one classroom, but even across different classrooms that span different grade levels. So I will generate a class code and would love it if some folks would follow along, whether it's live or you're just following along later on. Open a new tab or just type over the old one. Go to student.desmos.com and type in this class code, 9GF5H. We'll give a few seconds for folks who are following along live to get squared away, and then I'll actually put my student hat on and work through a few screens in the activity. All right, student.desmos.com. And then it's 9GF5H. So on this first screen, we're not given a lot of information or context. It's just collect some points and aim for a high score. And then I've got a little status report. I've collected zero blue points and zero red points, and my score is zero. If I'm a student, Staring at this screen, I have very little idea what's going on, but I do have a small hint. Drag the purple points, so I'll do that. And then I notice something's changed just by dragging this first purple point. I've now collected one blue point and two red points. I'm not particularly sure yet why that matters, but I've also noticed that my score has changed. I have a score of negative one. I don't totally understand that, so I'm gonna drag this point a little bit further. And now things are starting to come into focus. Here I've grabbed seven blue points and three red points. And I can click to see one, two, three. Those are my three red points. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven blue points. And they're highlighted visually as well. And then my score is four. I'm gonna make a conjecture as a student here that the way my score is calculated is blue points minus red points. And let me test that conjecture by grabbing a different slice of this number line. Let's go from eight to 10. And I notice I've got two blue and 10 red. Two minus 10 is negative eight. I feel like I understand what's going on on this screen. I'm not sure why I'm doing these things yet, but let's aim for a high score now. We wanna grab as many blue as possible and not quite as many red. Let's see, can I do any better than that? I think that might be my best. All right, as a student, I'm gonna move ahead to warm up number two. Here the directions say, edit the inequality. So we start students off with an inequality here. That's part of the scaffolding that we've built into this activity. Part of our commitment to easy to begin, difficult to finish activities. If you think back to screen one, all students had to be capable of doing here is clicking and dragging a pair of movable points and then making some observations. And even if they didn't maximize their score, maybe they got seven points, that's still a, a measure of success on this first screen and students are moving forward to following screens. So edit the inequality. I've collected three blue and 16 red. That's pretty awful. We've got all these red. I don't really want those. 
I want to switch to less than. And maybe as a student, you've recently studied inequalities, and so you understand these symbols and how they work, and this is an opportunity for practice. Or maybe this is the introduction that you're receiving to inequalities, and you're not quite sure what greater than and less than mean in this context. Maybe not even sure how to name these symbols. Well, this activity gives teachers an opportunity to have discussions around these symbols, uh, but with students interacting in an engaging experience where they have a target, and uh, some tools to, to pursue that target. It looks like less than is better, uh, but I feel like I'm missing out on these blue points. Let me change that to three, four, five. Okay, I notice here I'm getting this report that at least one person has a higher score. I'm gonna go back to four. Notice I'm not getting that point on the boundary. And it says that I have the highest score at least so far. I'm not sure if somebody else will be able to get a higher score. It looks like I've got the most points possible. As a student, I could then move on to the challenges where notice that we've pulled the scaffolding away. No longer do students have these movable points which are easily manipulable and no longer do they have a starter inequality. Students have, students have to use what they've learned in those first couple of experiences to begin here on their own. So maybe X minus 2 is where students would start and maybe they'd reverse that inequality and wrestle with the best number. Maybe they would explore greater than or equal to. Maybe they would move on to higher values, and it looks like I have the highest score so far. Now, this screen is just a step more challenging than this screen. But as we move through the rest of these, we offer students, and I'll give a nod to the variety of verbs here, instead of just drag the points, maximize your score, now we have a dispute to settle. So explain your thinking. Even use the sketch tools to illustrate your thinking. As I continue on, challenge two becomes more difficult and challenge three more difficult still. There's another dispute to settle and then challenges four and five and six are more and more difficult. Uh, so difficult that uh, I wasn't even able to solve this last challenge until I got some help from some folks on the Desmos team. So we, there with Point Collector, have built an activity that is rather easy to begin, but it's quite difficult to, to sort of wring all the goodness out of, to extract all of the, the great opportunities for mathematical thinking. So we get everybody rolling right at the beginning, but we make it difficult for a, a student to say, I've learned everything I can possibly learn from this activity, which allows a higher percentage of students to have a meaningful experience for the entire time of the activity. So that's our second example. We had sketchy fractions, we had point collector. Let's take a look at a third activity, and this one is all about connecting representations. And I'll mention a phrase in just a moment. It's, quote, joy in being the cause. So listen for that in just, just a moment. Let's take a look at function carnival. This is an activity which illustrates this idea of connecting representations. I'll create a class code and I'll take a look at my dashboard <clears throat> and I'm going to ask those who are following along to type in this class code 6GEXJ 6GEXJ I'll go to student.desmos.com see if I can remember it 6, nope, my memory is awful GEXJ I'll hit join say who I am, and I'm off to the races. All right, so I have this illustration, this little animation, this cannon person, got a parachute at the end, safe landing. I can either watch that again or go on. I think I'll go on. And the challenge here is to draw a graph of cannon man's height versus time. Um, I don't really have any idea what they're asking me to do, uh, so I'm going to hit play and then watch what happens. And I talked about joy in being the cause a moment ago. And this is something we've seen in research and in our activities and in other activities, that when a student does something, in this case, it's sketch something in this little coordinate plane. And then what they've done generates some behavior, some consequence elsewhere. There's some joy in that, and that joy grows as the challenges increase in difficulty and as students find success 
in tackling those challenges. So I've done a pretty awful job of matching this ghost cannon man. This cannon man goes up and then goes down, not always at the same speed. My cannon man just gradually, steadily rises and rises, and even when the parachute opens, continues rising, and then eventually leaves the screen. So at this point, as a student, I might notice that the axes are labeled. This is height off the ground, and this is time. And I can even scrub through this experience and realize that, you know what, right at this point in time, the cannon man hits his highest point off the ground. So I'm going to mark that. And as cannon man continues going, right here, the parachute opens. I'm going to mark that point as well. And as cannon man continues going, he lands right at the end. So the height would be zero. I'm going to mark that point as well. He's shot out of the cannon. Let's mark that point as well. And I notice he's increasing, rather his height is increasing. And I'll collect a few more points. Hi, Michael. <laughs> this is Stephanie. Hey, I have a question. Okay, I'm, I got two cannon men. I think maybe because I drew an extra dot, but I have one guy coming up and then a yeah. second man in blue, and then both of them get parachutes. Is that supposed to happen? <laughs> That is, okay, so yes, that is supposed to happen, and no, it's absolutely not supposed to happen, and then I'll just remind you, yes, it is supposed to happen. Let me explain <laughs> what I mean by that nonsense. Um, so this is not very fair, because I've played this game before. I'm fairly good at matching Cannon Man's height versus time graph, and I'll show you that after, you know, it's not perfect, but it's a pretty solid match, and after a handful of minutes, quite a few students, through attempts, and reflection and feedback, and then that loop cycling through repeatedly, students are able to match the height versus time graph, and then they move on to another challenge. All the while, they have that joy of being the cause, and we have this incredibly clear connection between a graphical representation and the context of the scenario here. Now let me show you uh, what you mentioned, which is Maybe I just, I don't know what's going on, so I'll sketch that. And then maybe I do this as well. Uh, and now I click play, and I haven't cleaned up my mess. I have two cannon men. Okay. So teachers who are familiar with functions, their definitions, their notation, etc., they would know that um, any graph that looks like this to represent a function has serious issues. Like this, I'll just highlight this right here. What does this actually say? This is that right here and right here, the height, so this is a specific time. This looks like about almost three seconds into our little experiment. The cannon man's height is both, however high this is, let's call that 20 feet, and 30 feet. And we can have a great conversation, again, centered around student work. We build our exposition, our explanation around correct and incorrect things that students have done. And we get to say, what's going on there? Well, you've represented the cannon man as occupying two different heights at mm -hmm. a single time. And we get to have the discussion about whether or not that makes sense in the physical representation. And we can then import students' understanding there, where they have a sense that, like, something's wrong. I've got extra cannon men. In fact, we can make this even worse. <laughs> like, I've got, like, I I'm overwhelmed by cannon men. And we can talk about their understanding here and import that understanding into this more abstract but super important graphical representation. So it's part of that joy in being the cause that we actually programmed it, that if students, quote unquote, break the machine, we will actually report out what they said is happening. So if you watch closely here, I'm going to have mm -hmm. one there, one there, and if we wait for it, one there. So we that's think that's kind of. Oh, what's, I had an what's extra that? dot. I had an extra dot. In, yeah. Uh, in and that, we, think, okay. <laughs> we think that's a delightful way of engaging with real student thinking, and addressing their misconceptions, not with a how many times to tell you kind of approach, but hmm, that's interesting. I wonder what that would actually mean if that could happen. And and so that's Cannon Man, which is a part of Function Carnival. Uh, which, again, is illustrating this idea that 
connecting representations is an incredibly valuable thing to keep in mind when you are designing and using activities. So I have one more activity I'd like to show off, and I want to make sure we save some time for questions. Um, after we finish looking at this fourth activity, uh, I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about the tools that we have uh, developed to support these rich conversations that I've been talking about uh, over the last few minutes. So here's our fourth activity, the fourth principle I'd like to illustrate. We design activities with an attempt to create an intellectual need for new mathematical skills. So just about every teacher can remember a time, maybe even as recently as yesterday, where students asked, when am I ever going to use this? When am I going to need this? And our approach to answering that question is a preemptive one. So what we want to do, and this activity, it's called the intersection, illustrates this. And I'll actually, instead of generating a class code, I'll just preview this one. We try to design experiences for students where they feel the need for some mathematical concept or structure or object so that when we give them that object and teach them a little bit about it, number one, they're thankful rather than resentful. And that might be mild thanks. It might not you know, result in big thank you cards and a, and a bouquet of flowers or, or a stack of balloons. Um, but they're at least mildly thankful and grateful for the, the new tools, the new power that we've given them. Um, and and that, that word power, I'll, I'll play on that a little bit more. They actually feel more powerful in meaningful ways than they did when they began the activity or the experience. So teaching by example only, and granted, like direct instruction you know, has its role in math education, um, but maybe not as like the first thing we do in introducing a new concept. So we like to give students a little bit of a headache and then supply the mathematical aspirin. And here's an example of that. This is called the intersection. And my task as a student is to think about where these lines will intersect if they continued on. And my task is to drag the point to show my prediction. So I, let's see. I think it's going to be right around there. Um, and then how confident are you about your prediction? Um, somewhat confident? Question mark? I, I don't know if I'm super confident there. Now I'll move on to the next one. And here's what I'm greeted with as a student. Bummer. Looks like you missed the mark. And we even have evidence of where I left the point on the previous screen. But uh, there is hope. Let's give it another try and see if I can get it on the second time. And so maybe that one was a little too high and not far enough out. I'll go right there. And then, hmm, still off. Third time's the charm, right? OK, maybe I'll, I'll try to split the difference and do something like, I don't know. And I don't know if you can feel it as you watch me manipulate the points on the screen, but students feel something here um, right now <laughs> called uh, tediousness. Like the experience of dragging points, not having a lot of information, by the third screen, my hope as an activity designer is that they're actually a little bit annoyed by this experience. And they think, that better not say fourth time is the charm on the next screen. Like, this is insanity, just doing the same thing over and over again, not finding success, and then kind of beating my head against the wall and not doing anything different. So still no luck. All right, maybe there's a better way. So what would help make a more accurate prediction? And there's a number of things that I've seen students and teachers say here. One of them is, um, make the lines extend further. Or maybe it's, um, can I know, and this, this actually came from a teacher rather than a student, can I know the equation, equations of the lines? That would be certainly helpful if you have some command of algebraic thinking. Um, the most popular response, and the one that makes me smile because it feels, I don't want to be too devious here, or subversive, but it feels like a gotcha moment. The students say, um, uh, maybe if we had a grid. So let's go to the next screen. And now I do have a grid. And let's think about the difference in experience on this screen compared to the first three. So I notice, and this is basically a big shout out for all middle school teachers who do anything with rate of change, anything with slope. So I notice that this line, this segment anyway, extends, we've got two units to the right and one unit up. So I can assume that 
I'm going to have two units to the right and one unit up, two units to the right and one unit up, two units to the right, and so on. So I can imagine points that this line will pass through. This one here, I've got to make an assumption here. I, I don't know if this is a safe assumption, but it looks like in two units to the right, this line segment gets halfway down. So maybe two more and it would be all the way at that lattice point. And one down, that would be four units to the right. Which means I found a point where these will both intersect. And let me see if I can get that exact point. Then I'll go to the next screen. Describe your strategy. Uh, here's a, an opportunity to gather student thinking. And maybe they extend the lines or maybe they use words to describe what they did. And then we gather that thinking. and. Um, sort of funnel that into a conversation with the entire class. And then here's a, a screen that is designed to highlight the value of our fourth attempt, or I should say the mathematical structure that came along with our fourth attempt. So notice my first guess. It was off by a little more than one. My second guess, a little better, but still off by more than half a unit. Here I was pretty close to half a unit, and then here I was off by actually nothing. I nailed that fourth attempt. And this is actually a much more interesting screen when there are multiple students in the mix. Here I just have my own points as a student preview. But every other student's guesses will be on here. I should say the error of their guesses. So on one, we'll often have a range of guesses. Uh, and two, likewise. And three, likewise. But four, they're often compressed close to or equal to zero. And students often notice that the fourth attempt was the easiest. We found the most success there. And then we get to talk about why. And the, the driving point here is that the grid, and specifically thinking about rates of change with a grid in the background, those are really helpful tools for thinking about how lines behave, how they move through the coordinate plane. And then if we wanted to push this a little bit further, we might even think about the algebra. You can think of this as an extension where we can use the algebra to confirm what we um, predicted based on slope and rate of change. So there's our fourth activity designed to highlight um, an opportunity to create intellectual need for new mathematical skills. Here, the intellectual need would be, I wish I had a grid here. When we supply the grid, we get to have some interesting conversations about slope and rate of change in the coordinate plane. Let's talk about tools for a moment. Actually, before I do that, let me pause. Um, that was a lot of me talking and folks listening. Uh, and in a live setting, it's easier to see uh, people's eyes glaze over, and it's a little harder to see that through a webinar. But Amy and Stephanie, why don't I take a breath here? And are there any activity-related questions that you have or that folks have raised in the chat menu so far. Hi Michael, this is Stephanie. I've been keeping an eye on the questions box. I'll see if anything comes in. Um, but I was curious, is it possible to make your own Desmos activities? Yeah, absolutely it is. Um, so there's, let me actually jump there. Now, I'm going to go to teacher.desmos.com, and I'll, I'll take a closer look at this later on. Uh, maybe I'll just do it now. Uh, there's a number of things that you get if you go to teacher.desmos.com, and we've named it this way so that teachers know, like, that's, desmos.com is for everybody. Teacher.desmos.com is the site for teachers to find activities. And we have an activity pick of the week, something we think that if you're focusing on this content, this would be a great activity to use with your students. We have a few more featured activities, and these get shuffled around, I believe, once a week. We also have bundles of activities, ready to go, um, not just individual activities, but a sequence of things you might do over the course of a couple of weeks. And then we also have uh, uh, instant links to the most popular activities, and the latest activities that have been created, as well as the ability to search for activities. So maybe I want to look for things related to lines, or maybe I want to look for things related to fractions. And I, I mention all of this to highlight the one major category that all of this stuff fits into. It's the stuff that already exists. And as a busy teacher, you can pick it up, take a look at the sample screens, take a look at the brief activity, and then if you like it, use it. It's as simple as that. But I also point all of this out to say that there is another category, and it's custom activities, that you can create. 
So I won't go there now because it probably warrants a, a longer discussion if I do go there. But if you were to click, click this custom tab, there would be an option in the top right to create your own activity. And we invite folks to use what exists as a nice way to get familiar with Desmos activities. And then if inspiration strikes and you have an idea for something you'd like to build that doesn't exist, absolutely those tools exist and you can use those to build um, something to your heart's content. That's great to know. Thank you. Yeah, and maybe yeah, like some of that customization could be a very uh, good topic for part three. <laughs> yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, we did get a question in from Walter. He wants to know if there's any limit to the number of students who can be, I, I'm assuming he means in the activity at one time. Yeah, absolutely. Let me ask a quick follow-up question before I give the, like, the, the larger answer to that. Um, Walter, how many students are you thinking about including there? Uh, and that will give me a framework for my answer. Let's see if he will type in <laughs> or potentially I can unmute him. Let's see. Walter, I've unmuted you if you want to uh, answer my 30. 30, 30, he says. Yeah, 30 is no problem. Um, so we've seen you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 with ease. Uh, in some of the, so the many folks at Desmos speak at uh, math education conferences uh, here in California, uh, where we're headquartered, as well as across the country. Um, and in some of those sessions, we've pushed the limits even further than a standard classroom setting. So there isn't a technical limit. Um, there's some point where you'd have performance issues, but if you're thinking about a classroom, 30 is no problem. That's a piece of cake. Um, and much beyond 30, like some teachers have said, can I use, you know, can I get to 150? And the answer is technically yes, but we don't recommend it for a couple of reasons. One is we're wondering about performance issues at that point. We haven't tested a lot of these activities at, at those high numbers. But also, and I'll, I'll get to this, this might be a nice segue to discussing the tools. When you're looking at the teacher dashboard, we found that hands down the best experience is to only have responses from a current class period. And most teachers have maybe 20 to 40 students in each of their classes. And so 20 to 40 students in a given dashboard uh, is a, a good rule of thumb. If you use the same class code with say a first, second, and fifth period, you might end up with 60, 70, 80, 90 or more students in there and not all of those responses would be immediately relevant. And so our advice is use a new class code. They all cost the same amount, zero dollars. Use a new class code for each class period, but don't worry at all about you know, 20, 30, or 40 students logging in with that class code. That, that should work like a breeze. And so I will actually use that question as a launching point to briefly show off some of the tools that we have built. Uh, this is a, a look at current tools, and we've got some exciting ideas for tools in the future. And I'll also just mention that a, a huge portion of what we have built here is based on feedback we get from real classrooms, whether it's us visiting to observe, whether it's us uh, taking the reins and, and leading a lesson in a class, or whether it's folks writing in and saying what does and doesn't work and what they'd really love to see exist in their classrooms. So we've taken all of that feedback that we've gathered and continue to refine our tool set. And the, the, I guess, hub of all of these tools is the teacher dashboard. And so if I can hop over here, I'm not actually going to ask folks to, um, we only have about 10 minutes left in, the, in this webinar. So I'm not going to ask folks watching to play along here, but I will show um, a dashboard from a recent activity that I ran where I can look at all of these students here on the side and I can look at all of their responses. Here the, the challenge was write the equation of a line that passes through the point. And I can see Florence Nightingale's response here. I can click to see the equation that she used to generate that line through the point. I can even press the down arrow key to cycle through. Here I've got Alana and her equation and I've got Albert and I can see his equation, and then I can keep on cycling through all of these. These are actually delightful. Y equals 3, um, 2x plus 3, and notice here I've got an incredibly steep slope. I get to see either at a glance through this responses view or individual responses in full screen mode. I can see all of those responses that students have submitted. 
I can go to the next response. Here the question is, what would it look like if all of your classmates' lines were shown on the same coordinate plane? And so it's the same question here, but imagining everybody's response all together. What would that look like? And I just love some of these responses. Let me zoom in just a little bit. Somebody said, kind of pinwheely, spokes, a starburst, got lots of lines meeting at the red point, like fireworks and so on. And we can actually go back to this first screen. And one of my favorite views in all of the dashboard is overlay. Whoops, let me zoom out again and click overlay. And we get to see every student's response generated on an individual coordinate plane, which oftentimes will spark rather interesting discussions. Here it's a follow-up to the question I asked on screen two. And as I move through other screens, sketch a line with negative slope. Here I get to see student sketches and all of the different negative slopes that they envisioned. We can talk about what's the same for all of these and what's different. Notice that some of these lines pass through the origin, some of them above the x-axis, some of them below, but they all have that downward trajectory from left to right. So I can see all of these responses at a glance. There's even little detail on the side. I can see individual student sketches here. So Maria, I notice she hasn't responded here. I might walk over to her and ask if she needs some help getting started on this screen or if there's something that she's wondering about here. I can continue on to the fourth response. I'll show you what the actual question looked like. Consider the line. Here's what another student sketched. Can you write an equation for the line? So here I'm collecting rather formal thinking, and I see all of these students responded with their algebra. I can click summary and see all of these responses. In fact, all of these students generated the same response, and we get to have a conversation about how maybe those first, that first group of students, how their responses differed from this second group of students. I can even zero in and talk about similarities and differences between these two sets of students. So this is the dashboard in a brief activity. Here's a, whoops, sorry about that. Here's a settle a dispute screen. Uh, here's another line, two students, their equations, who's correct and how do you know? And then a final screen, here we've got a card sort where I have a variety of equations and then cards uh, with graphs and I have to organize these uh, to end up seeing which graphs go with which equations and so on. All of this information about how students are doing streams right into my teacher dashboard and I have an opportunity to, uh, number one, see how my students are doing and then respond to that either in individual, small group or whole group ways. And then also I get to take student responses. In the example of a card sort, maybe I want to see what was the most common incorrect grouping. There are a lot of students, in this case three out of my 19, who put these cards together when they don't belong together. So at Desmos we put a high premium on student discussion in the classroom and we want to equip teachers to facilitate those discussions in the most engaging, effective, and efficient ways. And we feel like serving up student responses in the dashboard that can then um, provide the, the content or the, the focal point for those classroom discussions, we feel like that's um, helpful for teachers and that's why we've built these tools around those. So let me jump back to the slides. That's a, an overview of the teacher dashboard. More recently, we've added some functionality to the dashboard that we call our classroom conversation tools. And if your eyes sort of wandered while I was looking at the dashboard, you may have even seen glimpses of these in the corner. The first of these three features that we've added is called Anonymize. I'll actually demonstrate this, or at least point it out here. It's in the bottom left corner. And as soon as you click this, and I've actually activated it already, as soon as you've activated this, all of the names in the margin here are famous mathematician and scientists rather than the actual students and their names. And the reason we do this is sometimes students are caught up with who responded first, fastest, most correct, who was right, who was wrong, and we feel like that's the wrong place for student attention to be. We would rather shift that student attention over to what was the response and is it correct or incorrect and why do I think it's correct or incorrect? We want to shift the 
the focus of the conversation onto the math and away from who's right, who's wrong, and all the pride and shame that comes with that. We want to make the classroom a place where wrong answers can actually spark the most meaningful discussions and we're not so caught up about who gave the wrong answer. And Anonymize allows us to do that. There's also the ability to manage your class. And if you look at the bottom right image on this screen, sometimes you might have a student who submitted a, an inappropriate comment or maybe even logged in under an inappropriate name. And with the click of a button, we allow you to basically mute their impact on the dashboard as a whole. You still get to see their responses behind the scenes or after class, but students uh, don't have to look at their responses uh, during the discussion because an inappropriate comment here or there can sometimes derail uh, an interesting and, and meaningful discussion. So that's anonymized. We feel like it's a, a great way to keep the focus on the math. The next hey, feature Michael? that we've... Oh, yeah. Sorry, I just want to give you a, a little warning. We should wrap up um, pretty shortly. So. Great. <laughs> I didn't I'll, mean I'll to, to wrap up in the next uh, 90 seconds or so. Wonderful. Great. Thanks for the heads up. The yeah. second feature that we've added as part of our classroom conversation tool set is pause. Sometimes you don't want students to continue working on a screen. You want to pose a question and have a conversation. Or you might want to give them a little more instruction or highlight an interesting response from screen two or three. We've added pause to allow teachers to navigate those moments more effectively and easily. And likewise with teacher pacing, sometimes you might want to draw all of your students onto an individual screen. Students work at different paces and we've actually allowed for that in the default mode of our activities, which is student paced. But sometimes you might want to draw all the students into an individual spot in the activity to have a social experience. And um, I'll sort of gloss over the notes from this classroom visit, but recently uh, some members of our team went to a classroom in San Francisco and they watched students actually cheer in the room during the lesson. Uh, and the reason for this cheer was that at one point the teacher paused the activity, brought all the students to an individual screen, thereby depersonalizing the experience, but she did that for a reason. She wanted to socialize the experience. And even though our tools can be thought of as like classroom management tools, we really want to think of them as classroom conversation tools, uh, tools that allow teachers to restore the healthy noise in their classroom, the discussion, the arguments, all of those good things that are part of a rich activity. We want to give teachers tools to navigate that uh, more effectively. And we feel like those three tools, anonymize, pause, and teacher pacing, allow teachers to do that. And if you'd like to actually read in more detail about what we have in mind behind all of that, head over to the Desmos blog and look for a post in September of 2016 about our classroom tool set. So about a half a minute more, here's my invitation for anybody who is following along live with us here in the webinar or those who are watching this as a recording later this week or maybe even in a future month. Three quick steps uh, that I think could have a profound impact on the months ahead. Number one, use something you learned today. Maybe something big, maybe something small. And I'd encourage you to use it in the next two weeks. Number two, share something you learned today with a colleague. And number three, head over to www.desmos.com for the next step in your learning adventure. And I'll even just show what the website looks like. This will take you to our graphing calculator. It'll also take you to two new calculators that we've recently released that teachers of younger students might be particularly interested in. We now have a four function calculator and a scientific calculator. And just like everything else with Desmos that you'll find here on the website, this is all free. If you wanted to get to the classroom activities that were the focal point of our conversation today, you go to teacher.desmos.com. You can launch out to that site from here. And then possibly the most important tool for learning about all of these resources to continue your own learning adventure, you can head over to learn.desmos.com. And again, you can get to all of these things from desmos.com. We've got one-click access to all of our resources from that page there. So I'll just close with this. My name again is Michael. If you want to reach out on Twitter, I'm at MJ Fenton. If you want to send me an email, it's Michael at Desmos. And thanks to those who were following along live and also to those who were watching this as a recording. Hopefully it proved helpful to you in your own progression as a math educator. Thank you so much, Michael. This is really good stuff for me, someone who maybe math wasn't always my favorite 
subject. <laughs> um, I, I would have enjoyed that if I had the ability to have more conversation in class and not just have right and wrong answers. So I really like how you're Absolutely. incorporating that into your software. Um, can everybody see my screen? Yeah, I am able to. Okay, um, let me go to the last slide. Uh, we want to thank everyone for attending today. Again, um, there's some information here. You can reach Amy Alcalisi at this email and Michael Fenton at Desmos. And um, we are recording, as we said. I will get this up within the next 48 hours. You'll also get an email in about an hour that will give you a link to a brief survey. And when you complete the survey, you'll get a certificate of completion for today's webinar. Uh, and don't forget to check out our nr21.ctl.net site to uh, be informed about future upcoming webinars. And you can also join our Google Plus community for Nevada Ready 21 educators. So I want to thank Michael for presenting. And um, on behalf of CTL, thank you, everyone, for attending today's webinar. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Have a great day. Bye-bye. <laughs>